Kilda, how's it going? This is a video about something that in an ideal world I would not have to make a video about but nothing good can really come of this year and that trend continues uh, with some tragic news that affected me very very deeply and I've actually been thinking a lot about why it was so impactful to me and it's changed my perspective about life in some quite radical ways. I don't know if that perspective is going to be sustainable, but guess I'll find out. If you've watched my content in any ongoing capacity over the years, you'll be aware of this show called The Majority Report with Sam Cedar, which is obviously hosted by the eponymous Sam Cedar. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this is my most watched, most listened to political podcast or show of all time. I've watched a lot of political content over the years. I've never watched a show as consistently as The Majority Report. Do you know how easy numbers can be manipulated? Like, you are so ignorant. You got a degree in government. You literally went to school where they taught you the government was important. What? I would say that I've seen possibly every episode of this show since 2013, something like that. I don't know exactly when I started watching it. In my previous YouTube video, I complained a lot about YouTubers and the culture of competition and trying to have the most subscribers and be the most important and best and most influential voice. And the sort of capitalist construct and tenor of that, which I've taken issue with over time and which has really put me off a lot of people's content because I start to see them as very hypocritical and dishonest and not really living what they preach. But as my watching of other political content on YouTube has kind of fallen away, one show that I have kept watching and that I listen to every day because I just love it so much is The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. One of the reasons I've loved The Majority Report so much over the years is due to a contributor called Michael Brooks. What? <laughs> so he, he says first, Government government doesn't do anything. It, just ignoring like the history. And the first thing he names is the post. And then the first thing he names is something that works well. And then he uses a personal example of something that did work well to illustrate it, which was in fact the post office. I'm uh, I'm. <laughs> Unfortunately, on July 20, Michael Brooks passed away from an unexpected and sudden medical condition. Now, people die all the time, obviously. That's the sad thing about this world and this reality. The constant death. But the way that you process those deaths are decided by a few different factors, such as how well do you know the person, what's your feelings about that person, what's your exposure to that person and what they do, and how close do you feel to that individual? I wanted to in the past, but didn't make a video about famous people dying and sort of the effect that that has on you. And I can think of a few examples of people whose deaths really impacted me quite a lot. The number one example that comes to my mind is Chris Cornell of Soundgarden fame. I grew up listening to Chris Cornell and Soundgarden and later listening to Audio Slave. And when he died via suicide, I felt very sad very affected. I can't remember if I cried or anything like that. I may have, I just can't really remember. I think I may have cried listening to his music. You know, when musicians die that you really respect and that you grew up with or just really thought were incredibly talented and so you feel very sad that they passed. I think their music is often a trigger for causing sadness, which may produce tears. Chester Bennington of Linkin Park, who also committed suicide, I don't think that I was as fundamentally a fan over time um, of Linkin Park as I was of Soundgarden throughout my life. I sort of moved away from that style of new metal, rap metal kind of music and more into extreme metal and the real shit. But even though I've moved away from Linkin Park, I was very saddened by Chester Bennington's death. And I may have had a tear or two listening to their music as well. Another one that comes to mind is the singer George Michael, that's why I covered Careless Whisper on my channel at the time because he'd just died. The reaction to that was much more global and mainstream in nature. He was quite a bit more famous amongst just regular everyday people than Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington who are slightly more niche, although still very famous. Strangely, I mean, maybe it makes me a bad person, I don't know. David Bowie's death didn't affect me 
very much. I was never the biggest Bowie fan. And I thought, you know, we sort of got it covered. The collective sadness and grief over his death was so massive. It was sort of like, wow, little old me doesn't need to grieve about that. There's, there's plenty of people who are grieving David Bowie. Like, I'm not really... My contribution is not going to mean much. His death was a bit more like Michael Jackson or John Lennon or... Not quite, but almost. Uh, Princess Diana. The grief thing so overwhelming in society that it almost reaches a slightly absurd and ridiculous level to think one person could elicit uh, that much sadness over their dying and them not being Martin Luther King, but a musician. So that's been my experience so far of people I don't really know dying, who I may also respect and have admiration for and be a fan of. But when I learned about Michael Brooks dying, this was a completely different experience for me. This was much heavier, much more raw and personal feeling than any person that I don't know dying before. What happened for me was I was at work, I was finishing up the work day. Um, it was Tuesday in my country of New Zealand, so it would be Monday in the US. Packing up, I felt like it had been quite a difficult and stressful week thus far, just for those two days, coming back to work and dealing with all the stress and pain and bullshit of that. I picked up my phone, looked at Twitter, and it said, Michael Brooks has died of a sudden medical condition. And my reaction was literally this, just holding my phone and then No! I, I couldn't believe it. I was just in complete shock. I was basically just paralyzed from this news, staring at my phone like, how is this possible? And then I just burst into tears. I just started crying. Immediately. And I couldn't fucking stop crying. Because... It, it was literally like... Your best friend or an extremely close friend, or someone that you know very well, someone that you're familiar with, that you, you interact with, even though there's no actual interaction between me and Michael, but who you have some feeling of a relationship with, they're communicating to you, you can, you can see who they are every single day, is dead now. And... And it's weird, because now, while I'm making this video now, I feel like I can't recreate how I felt in that moment. And it lasted for about two days. It was basically, I was completely inconsolable on Tuesday. I drove home, I was crying the entire ride home, came home and just cried all night. Basically just cried myself to sleep. The next day at work, I basically work at a job where I can't really be away from people that much. But I was crying in all of the periods in between seeing other people. So I woke up, um, got in the car, on the way to work, crying, get uh, wipe my eyes in the car, go to work, do my thing, leave at morning tea to go eat something, cry, come back, do my work, um, try to not let people see how fucking miserable I am about this news that Michael Brooks is dead. Go to lunch, cry during lunch, hoping people don't see me finish the workday, go home and cry. And I've never had that feeling about somebody dying I don't know. But by about the third day, my sadness was still there, but I was easing off a little bit on the crying. So I sort of managed to relax a little bit. And now I don't feel like crying, but I still feel sad. Just a general feeling of sadness. And all of this has led me to reflect on life and the nature of life and death and also about why did I like Michael so much? What was it about him that made him so special to me and just somebody that I so deeply respected? There's something I can honestly say about Michael Brooks, which sounds like bullshit. It sounds like I'm just saying this because the guy died and when somebody dies, people have the virtue signal about that person. I don't really believe in virtue signaling as a concept, but whatever, that's beside the point. Sometimes in life, you just think random stuff as like a marker of where your thoughts are on a certain topic. Well, I do at least. I don't know if you do that or if other people do it, but there'll be a point where I will just be standing around and I'll think to myself, 
you know what? I really like pickles. Pickles are really good. That's something that I really like. It would just be a thought out of nowhere, and then from that point on, I've, I've marked that in my mind. So if someone asks me about pickles, I can do my mental inventory and say, check back. Yeah, I really like pickles, because I, I noted that down in my brain. Two or three years ago, for no particular reason, I was thinking about the online political landscape. What commentators do I like? Uh, who don't I really like so much? And I just had this thought. Michael Brooks is my favorite political commentator. And it was just like marking it down in my head. You know, long before his death, many years ago. And I have to think about why that is. Why did I like him so much? Why was I so heavily impacted and affected by his death? to the point of non-stop tears. And it's impossible to really know that when somebody has just died because the event of that person dying completely impacts your sense of that person. You can't be objective about it. You can't really say they're positive or flawed aspects in a really objective sense because it's so deeply impacted and affected you in that moment. Uh, he was just such an understanding, compassionate person. And on my, you know, most difficult days, he always knew exactly what to say to make me feel like it was going to be okay. And um, I, I can't describe at all how much of how how much loss I feel. And it's not just me; it's so many people um, who are having difficulty, you know, processing this today. But he he was someone who just again made me want to be a better person, and who inspired me to learn more, to challenge myself to step out of my comfort zone. And um, I, I, I already miss him and I'm gonna continue to miss him. And I just I just can't believe that this is this is this is what's happening. Um, I right. feel like I'm in a nightmare right now. But seeing people talk about Michael in the wake of his death did make it clear to me perhaps why all those years ago I thought to myself, Michael Brooks is my favorite political commentator. Almost every person that I've seen talk about him and Sam Cedar had like a four hour show talking about this, has said, what an incredibly kind, humanistic, friendly, down to earth person he was, who had the time for every person, no matter who they were. He would always respond to them. He would always take the time to invest in other people. He loved talking to people and meeting other people and when he did that, he was always kind. He didn't do bad things to people. There was nothing toxic about him. He didn't abuse anyone. He was legitimately a good person. And very strangely, seeing that made me think, yeah, Michael Brooks was a good person. There was nothing about him that I saw that gave off any red flags about any kind of toxicity or like an, a dark undercurrent of any kind. And I think that toxicity of people sometimes comes through, even if they don't know it or not. If you watch somebody every single week for many, 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 many weeks on end, there are going to be moments where you're going to pick up a certain sense of toxicity or a sense of them being a bad person. and. I just don't think that exists with Michael Brooks. Now, of course, I'd like you to remember that everything that I say is a little bit nuanced. That doesn't mean that there isn't something out there. I'm just I'm not aware of it, so I don't know. And it doesn't mean that he was a perfect person. It doesn't mean he never got angry with people. It doesn't mean that he never fought with people. It doesn't mean that he never had relationships that didn't work out with others. But so often in this political space that we occupy, there are people preaching about what good people they are, who talk about how they want to fix society so much, who talk about all the different things that they want to do to make the world a good place. But interpersonally and as a human being, they don't really display those values. They don't really come across as somebody who's really inclusive and welcoming of other people. There's been a lot of talk, including from his sister, saying that Michael had a lot of problems with cancel culture. Cancel culture is this concept of if you do something wrong or problematic or insulting or mean or cruel or, I don't know, racist or homophobic or misogynistic or transphobic or whatever other bigotry you'd like to think of, then they are a terrible human being who very punitively has to be 
cancelled if a person is berated enough and treated enough as being a bad human being they've been cancelled and his sister said that he had a huge problem with that and that was his next big thing on sunday night when we spoke we, we spoke almost daily michael and i were very close and he's just been really talking about a couple of things like his work had been evolving i don't know if of those around you who closely follow his work, but he was getting so clear on just like, he just was so over cancel culture. I'm going to pull up my notes because this was like the stuff that we just talked about daily that he was just like so done with. And he just, he was getting so clear on like how things had to move forward and what had to happen to like actually unify people. Okay, I'm going to read from what I jotted down. Michael was so done with identity politics and cancel culture. He was showing so clearly that we had to build a world where people can listen to one another through all of their differences without shutting down or turning to violence. That together we need not to define who we are, that we're all in this together, which did not mean that we give up for the fight for peace and justice or treat people with integrity and respect, just that we fight that fight more skillfully. Basically the technology really built into the technology is the incentivizing of all of the cruelty, gossip, nonsense, and drama, and the kind of ultimate irony of seeking the intensity of that experience as just being, I mean, it happens outside, it happens across all politics, but it is really specifically antithetical to the left because it's completely antithetical to a culture of either, you know, frankly, like openness, strength, uh, forgiveness, change, uh, and also just sort of like being like fully paid up, hopefully, a, you know, like grown up on some level. And, and just, you know, the complete lack of humility, I think too, um, is mm -hmm. also gross because again, I think like, ironically, if it was building a culture where people could be much more open about all of our, you know, where they're relevant, most of them, you know, you know, aren't because like privacy is obviously an obvious thing, but like, you know, people's growth, people's mistakes, people's transgressions that everybody, I'm so sorry to say has done, um, you know, it, it, it creates like this, this like punitive, insane madhouse atmosphere where it, there isn't an incentive structure to, to grow. Um, so and that's I think so it's true. So when I thought about that, I also thought, am, so am I going to cancel Michael because he hates cancel culture and that's just a red flag for someone being a piece of shit? No, because I mean, I can't speak for Michael because he's, he's not here, but I got the sense that his issue with cancel culture was the fact that the whole issue itself, just the whole idea of this cancel culture thing is a distraction from the conglomeration and the monolithication, I don't know if that's a word, of capital and power, which is basically dominating all of the societies of the world and causing us to be oppressed and generating power structures which lead to an ongoing status quo. That so long as everyone is fighting and bickering about these interpersonal issues about is that racist or is that sexist or is that misogynistic or what have you there's no way for even the left to come together and it's just increasingly shrinking the kind of um, power base of people who in other respects would want to liberate the masses they're too busy go going at each other's throats about something this person said or that person said or did and i don't think it would be that it's because those issues don't matter at all like if someone is misogynistic or sexist or racist or transphobic etc like that's a bad thing um obviously and it's not something that doesn't matter but if that is being focused on to the detriment of actually liberating the people from the oppressive power structures then that's a big problem and i feel like that was kind of the core of michael's philosophy I think that he was increasingly thinking about how do we actually build a real legitimate big tent for people to actually get on board with some sort of movement. It can't be just by moral policing. I think there should be standards and I think Michael would have thought there should be standards too otherwise he wouldn't spend so much time going after the right for disgusting bigoted awful things but that that can't be the basis of a left-wing and leftist movement. Now I think it's very complicated because I also think that the actual obsession 
with cancel culture is a gift to the right. And I have no idea what Michael thought about that. All I can imagine is that he had a very nuanced and contextual view of what his issues were with cancel culture. My issue with cancel culture is just the very concept itself, but I think that is compatible perhaps with what Michael was saying, which is just the distraction aspect of it. And that's one of the sad things about Michael dying at the age of 37. I would have loved to see what he was going to do. We're not going to get to see that now. And it seems like everything for him was really building and growing and he was changing as a person and maturing. In the past, he could be seen as someone who was very kind of, well, I've seen people describe him as caustic or mocking or sarcastic, constantly making fun of different people. And I know, I know what his detractors are saying. Tim, you just said he was such a nice guy, but he's like mocking people. But I think you can mock people for the right reasons. You can satirize and lampoon other people. So long as you're doing it about something which is in itself something that should be downplayed because it's harmful. That's just using humor. That's just satirizing something. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's what Michael did. He just made fun of stuff that was horrible and that's fine. For me, people talking about cancel culture and being obsessed with that is often a red flag of them actually being a piece of shit and just being worried about when they actually do something shitty and people call them out for it, that they've been canceled, oh my god. But Michael was a very thoughtful individual. He always thought through his positions and I saw complaints about him actually and I've even had the same complaint in the past that he just talks too long sometimes. Okay, there's like 20 million things. So first of all, the the um, <laughs> is it the IOL, the inter inter is it the International Organization of Labor Standards or whatever? That provision? International, yeah. International Organization of Labor. Yeah. That's what, so Elizabeth Warren says, let's make them set uh, global labor standards as well. That was in the and TPP I'm though. That Those requirements were there for you to be a trading partner in the That's TPP. That's what I just to you though. Okay not enforceable that's what i just explained that's the reason see if you don't have an enforcement mechanism this is see this is why like things i think this is where things get really interesting right yeah if it's just theoretical then it's just the then like it's just air like sure like trade is good trade is bad in trade you can make an argument actually accelerated trade is very bad for the climate you know, we, there's all sorts of arguments we can have, and they're interesting and ethereal. Okay. But I like to talk like an actual policy. Sure. So that agreement and all of these agreements, they have a provision for investors. If an investor says country X is violating my uh, terms on foreign direct investment, mm -hmm. and it is not just expropriation, it's – there have been any number of cases brought on it. Sometimes they win, sometimes they lose, but I'm talking about the structure. Okay. There is a structure that values investors over worker and environmental concerns. Wait, how? That's the reality of those agreements. Wait, how does the structure now, favor them? No, in ter because they're the only ones with internationally enforceable standards for their interests. I mean, that's, come on, that can't be complicated. I, I don't understand what you mean though. The ISDS panels have people chosen from both parties that can represent them. And, no, and also, wait, what that's do you mean? Not, no, they don't. Yes, they. That's, that, how, wait, wait. Okay, wait. Hold on. Wait. I, but I don't even agree. Firstly, I don't understand no, what, what you say this, when you when you wait, wait. When you say that only an investor. Wait. I, hold on. When you say so that only in when you sides? when what you, basis do you say sides? Because that's Where do you get the, it's literally in the provisions of the TPP for how they nominate the panels of the. Sides. You mean both countries? No, no. For an investor and a country, both of them get to nominate people to panels. Yeah, that's country. Nobody from environmental or labor. Okay, but I don't understand. Right. Okay, I don't when, when you say that these things favor. I just want to be really clear. I just want to be really. <laughs> no, 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 slow down. Slow I'm, well, down. I'm, not, I'm. I have to go fast because I haven't said well, anything. These are like. Well, but these are the points. No, no, you but, know, like, the, I don't, but I don't know. I disagree like, with so many things that I haven't got to address. But like, there's nothing. Okay, I mean, I don't know what's your disagreement. But I. Wait, look, oh, well, let me tell you then. Wait, can I tell you one disagreement? So you're okay, but you got to stay inside the parameters of what is actually happening in reality. Okay, well, okay. So, fuck, there's like a million things. 
Some of these cases you're wrong on. Some of these cases I'm right on. We have different interpretations. That's fine. But the broader argument about what this agreement is is unavoidable. And that's the fundamental distinction. But I actually, I really do have to run. But we could do this again if you want. Yeah, sure. I'd love to go over some more specifics of this sometime. But thanks for the conversation. Hey, man, it was my pleasure, for real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hope, I, I, I know we, we it, it went places. I hope we got some good stuff done, though. Okay. I really appreciate it, man. Have a All good right. one. All right, take care, man. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> I'll hopefully talk with him again. I'll let him talk more. I thought it's a part of it was productive. I will say I've seen a lot of people who actually thought that the information was actually really important and interesting and that it went well. And when I see too much whining and complaining from people on social media, uh, not, not Destiny, but just like, you know, people tweeting like, eh, you didn't let him talk enough. That's like, okay, that's not a good sign for like, if you don't have anything to say about the merits and the substance, if it's just sort of tone whining, then I'm very skeptical. Uh, yeah, I think people need to realize that when they uh, confine themselves to aesthetic judgments about things, that they're not really saying anything at all. Precisely. Jay Cool. Hey, Michael, saw your discussion with Destiny. I think you did very well. Thank you. I think you pointed out how clear Destiny with uh, differences Destiny has with leftists. He cannot fathom why labor environmentalists have a role in crafting trade agreements. Yes. And I'm not going to relitigate it because he's not here, but yes. But I saw a YouTube comment that perfectly captured why, at the end of the day, that wasn't really a problem. It basically said, it's not that Michael talks too much. It's that Michael had so much to say. And that is so true. He would always want to work through his points and really flesh out the kind of landscape on which things were being discussed. Michael wanted to set the stage to have an actual intellectual conversation about the history and the context of the issue. And YouTube's not designed for that, and YouTube personalities are certainly not designed for that. So that was often taken as Michael being pretentious and overly wordy and not being mindful of other people. But on the memorial stream about Michael on the majority report, I can't remember who said it, but somebody said basically that he was like that with everybody. He would take a very long time to make his points. And it's because he wanted something more thoughtful. He wanted something more substantial and deeper than just the, the bullshit everybody talks about on a surface level just to win some sort of political conversation. The thing that really stands out about Michael, I think, is the fact that he wanted to so deeply explore these topics, and it's incredibly rare. And it also shows, I think strangely, a kind of lack of ego. Many people on the right had a huge issue with him because they thought, oh, he's abrasive, he's obnoxious, he's mean, or what have you. But uh, uh, that satire, I think was basically about about views that if you really broke them apart you would find the reason as to why those are shitty and awful and terrible views when it came to actually exploring the things that really mattered and are actually impactful on the lives of everyday people and workers i think that michael displayed a radical amount of empathy and kindness as i said before i can't sum up the totality of michael brooks life and all of his interests all of the things that he was looking at and getting into and that he was developing his thoughts and passions on but one thing a lot of people mentioned in the wake of his death was that he was really getting into and developing his knowledge and feeling around spirituality and his inner life his sense of being present and at peace and his calmness and i think that's something that i often take for granted um being present um spirituality it's something that i don't really feel in touch with and that i often ignore and don't try to develop i don't know the details of exactly what it was he was getting into and i'd like to find out more about that and i think i could take that as a cue to think more about spirituality to not treat that so flippantly because you never really know what's going to happen so attaining some sort of inner peace can only be a positive thing knowing what i do about michael i can only assume that he was looking to different philosophies from around the world philosophies not in the western tradition but from many different places and a variety of 
sources. But I just wanted to note that I'm aware of that and that that's an important thing to consider. Being spiritual. I think there's many elements and aspects to spirituality and I can only assume that he was getting into that in a very thoughtful way because that's how he got into everything. I think and actually in a way, in some ways, some people who have th some of these interests and have also had really powerful experiences with whether it be meditation or psychedelics um, or even spirituality that's anchored in movements like liberation theology, uh, actually, like, I get the disgust with what most people talk about with religion and, mm -hmm, and spirituality mm -hmm. as much as most atheists, maybe even more, all yeah. kidding aside. But at the same time, it strikes me, and even including like, I, I don't have it in front of me, but there's that incredible quote from Gramsci written from prison to his son where he talks about why he studies history because history is the study of people mm -hmm. and we should reflect on people and we should expand the category of people in our care essentially. Mm -hmm. That type of overriding empathy and a willingness to seriously self-assess and self-work because again, there's so much toxicity and narcissism and delusion in politics across the board, but it matters for us more because we're trying to do something better, that it kicks in, it matters who we are and how we're relating to this stuff. I think my brother's in a good place. The last thing I'm gonna share is on Sunday night, he was working with um, the coach and, and um, mentor that we work with and he, he closed his eyes and did a visualization with her. And here are some of the things he told her that, that he saw. He closed his eyes, he said, I'm feeling spaciousness inside me, like outer space or the ocean. He said, all my anxiety, it's over. I'm starting to love writing and I really want to keep it because it I really want to keep going because it feels great. I think from now on, I feel free of anxiety. I will write or do push-ups. <laughs> I haven't actually read these. <laughs> Hopefully it's not something terribly embarrassing. I like how I were like weighted push-ups. Um, and then he said, I would like to work in the coming weeks on the mechanics of what it means to continue separating myself from the stuff that separates me from me. I want to remember the inner. I think we all really need to fucking work on that. Whatever separating us from us, because that's what's disconnecting us. And it... It's so bad right now. We just, we need to, we, this fever pitch we're at, it, it just has to end. <sighs> That's what I've got, Sam. I'm going to take that as just another lesson from Michael Brooks. Don't take your presence and your nowness for granted. Although that's incredibly hard to not do and very easy to say. Your ideology, yes, is important because like there's certain standards of your ideology. If you th your ideology includes saying, um, this race of people can't live in my society because my society is an ethnostate. Obviously that's a non-starter um, as a political position. But that ideology alone is not the only way that you should build a movement because you need a diverse range of people who will have a varying levels of a sense of what is right and what is wrong. As I said, there's obviously a cutoff point, but if you ever want to get anywhere as a movement, you have to be able to say to people, we'll just talk about it and we'll figure it out. But we can agree on some fundamental issues. And it was those fundamental issues that I think that Michael was all about. And that's why he was really concerned about international politics. People often called him an internationalist. And the word globalist has really made looking to the rest of the world like some sort of ugly term. But that's just absurd. You know, there's somebody in China who is just as good and as just as human as I am. There's somebody in every country of the world who's just as good and just as human as I am. So why would we arbitrarily create these distinctions about different people in the world and then say they're my enemy and I have to figure out a way to like degrade them or undermine them? I think Michael really understood, no, like we need the whole world. And if people around the world are just as human as each other, that means that the struggles that are occurring in different countries are just as important as the struggles that are occurring in mind. And that's another way of knowing that he was, he was just a good, decent human being. And on empathy and kindness again, it's another sign that Michael was such a great person that he was remembered so much for being empathetic and kind. And that's a life lesson about death, which is that people are not necessarily going to remember how ideologically pure you were 
and how much you lauded over other people the kind of person that you were they're going to remember how interpersonally kind you were and how much you connected to other people and reached out to them that's the thing that's really going to matter and i think on that uh yeah i've failed a little bit because i never reach out to people and i ignore messages all the time i think i'm basically an opposite kind of person to michael i'm the sort of person who talks about doing the right thing but doesn't really do it so I'm like most of humanity. Whereas I think Michael was a better kind of person. Somebody who actually played that out in his everyday life. Everything is always about ego and how things relate to yourself. And that's the way that we interpret and process death too. So when this happened and Michael suddenly died, I just thought to myself, what was my own experience with Michael? I only ever had two interactions with him ever. It was quite a few years ago, I messaged him out of the blue, and I said, Hey Michael, I'm a massive fan, and I just want to say, I love what you do, I watch you guys every day, and you're fantastic, you're one of my biggest inspirations. Here is my YouTube channel, um, you helped inspire me to make videos, if you are keen, check it out. And he said, oh, thanks man, yeah, I'll, I'll have a look at it, thanks a lot. And I thought... That's the last I'll hear of that. He's not going to respond to me again. Well, it was cool to talk to Michael Brooks, but um, that's about it. That's, that's the only interaction I'm gonna have with the guy. Not long after, he had an interview with Sargon of Akkad slash Carl Benjamin slash Benjamin of Akkad slash Akkad of Benjamin, whatever you wanna call him. In that conversation, Michael did the thing where he sets the landscape and he had about a 15 minute monologue off the top which completely took the ground out from underneath Sargon. And as a result of not wanting to do policy, history, geography, or economics, it leads to dumb ideas, bad policy, simplistic and delusional understandings about very important things. Look, I don't play video games, uh, so I don't make YouTube videos about them. It's important to have a grasp in the ground of what you're talking about. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, go um, ahead. Well, I'm, I'm convinced I'm talking to someone from the regressive left now, if that's any help to you. Uh, I'm identifying it's exactly what's going help. on It's a profound help. Well, I, you, you do seem to be profound. under a few misapprehensions. You, but okay, so, okay, but go oh, into on, actual on, detail. No, 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 you've just had like a five-minute monologue. So go into actual detail, though. Don't do silly ad hominem. Oh, go will, into actual detail. I will detail. go into detail. Right? Okay, go ahead. So how big is big enough for you to regard someone as important? That's the first question that comes up, because you think that the regressive left is made up of unimportant plebeians on the internet making ahistorical generalizations. And not just the, the no. thing you have to understand as well is the regressive left is not limited to opinions on Islam. But that is one of the major issues that people are trying to talk about that the regressive left is getting in the way of. But how, how big would these people need to be? What, what makes kind of me a member of the regressive left? No, no, no. No, you just question. threw it out, no, answer, so I want to know why. Answer my question. No, no, they, no. Well, you answer mine first, because you put a direct no, accusation my, at me. No, I asked my question first. You put a direct accusation at me. I don't care. I asked my question I first. Care. How big, I would, care. I don't care that you care. How well, I don't care that you don't enough? care that I care. What makes That's me a right. part of the regressive left? Go ahead. Justify Literally it. Literally your opening monologue. Right, so and explain that. And you said you don't understand why. So let's actually go ahead. get into that, shall well, we? Yeah, tell now, me why I'm in the regressive left. Go you, for it. You have made the assertion yes. that the people in the regressive left, who you agree are the regressive left, mm -hmm. are not big enough to be important. Mm -hmm. How big is big enough to be important to you? What makes me part of the regressive left was the question. No. A lot of Sargon's appreciators they complained that he let Michael Brooks set the stage for the whole conversation. Um, and he shouldn't have done that. He should have just interrupted Michael Brooks and, and tried to stop that from happening. But that's what Michael did. He wanted to have conversations from a position of truth about any given topic. And obviously that's not good for right-wingers. They need to set the stage themselves about something to do with masks being bad or um, shitting on Dr. Fauci for no particular reason. And it ended up that Michael Brooks completely crushed the fuck out of Sargon of Akkad, totally destroyed him. Everyone understood that Sargon of Akkad had been put in his place. Black people have been horribly- This has nothing to do with black people are inherently nice or inherently this or inherently that. It's a historical reality that they have been oppressed. And this is how, this is the problem with you guys. You're totally ahistorical. But look, you have the last word. We gotta be out in 30 seconds. 
Sure. Um, you shouldn't judge people by characteristics that they have no control over. Okay, and also Martin Luther King Jr., just so you know, he did call for affirmative action and massive wealth think, redistribution no, no. to deal with historical realities. Yeah, I'm sure he did. So if we can get to a point where you guys can as equally aggressively tackle actual things that exist other than just these idea games, we'll be yeah. in a better place. But the, the, I, I appreciate the, the debate. Ideas. The problem we're having is ideas. We, we have bad ideas in the West. There are bad ideas in the Middle East. That's the problem. I don't think bombs are going to solve the problem in the Middle East. I think better ideas will. And people like you and the regressive left are preventing better ideas from coming to the fore. No, Just so you know. You still haven't defined any of these terms, but I'll take your know, word I for it. You'll never, you'll never, use, I, will, I will never get it, but it was fun. And uh, maybe we will do it again, Mr. Sargon. I would love to. All right. Good day. Bye-bye. And right after that, Michael Brooks messaged me and said, So, man, how'd I do? Was it a good job? And I just said, yes, that was fantastic. You fucked him up. And Michael Brooks was like, really? I really appreciate that. And he seemed to just value my feedback about that. And I didn't tell him that I made videos about Sargon of Akkad or the culture war or that kind of thing. I just said I do progressive videos. So that told me that he definitely checked out my channel and watched my stuff. And he noticed that I was interested in shitting on Sargon so decided to message me back about it and i was satisfied after that i was like i don't feel the need to talk to michael brooks anymore because i know he's a great guy and it's really weird because i'm a very jealous and petty and pathetic and uh, weak person in many ways i just feel jealous of other people constantly if they're more successful than i am but weirdly i wasn't jealous ever of michael brooks i never thought like Oh, fuck, it sucks that that guy is so much more successful than me, you know, because I began to be completely ridden with this feeling of inadequacy about other people being better than me, you know, um, the kind of like guilt of failure and capitalism completely took me over. In the case of Michael, I just thought, I'm just glad he's out there. I'm glad he's saying these things. I'm glad he's the way that he is. I agree with him on almost everything and he's a such a good person and he's so entertaining and he's really helping um, in the world. So I, I just felt happy that he was there. And I've started to wonder why that is. Why was I not jealous of Michael Brooks but I am jealous of other people. And I think it's because with a lot of other people, I feel like they don't really walk the walk. They're not really about having integrity and being an actual real person. It's kind of like they've got this front about, oh, I'm left-wing and I'm progressive and, you know, I'm all about fighting for things that would actually help people, but they don't exercise that in everyday life and they focus on many petty things. There's that old saying that I'm gonna absolutely completely butcher right now. It's something like small minds focus on people, medium minds, I guess, focus on ideas and then huge minds <laughs> focus on concepts. But Michael, I, I gotta be honest, he, he didn't fully encapsulate that. He encapsulated all of those worlds. He had kind of like a small, medium, big mind all mixed together because he could focus on the people of the people, like Dave Rubin. But I mean, come on, like, it's Dave Rubin. How can you avoid that? Extremely low-hanging fruit. But he also talked so much about history and concepts and ideas it's kind of like he was covering all of the lanes he was covering the small medium and large minds all at the same time so I'm making this video I wanted to sum up Michael Brooks but I feel like that's impossible to do so at this point I'm just rambling and just sort of going on and on if you want an idea of how awesome Michael Brooks was the only thing that you can do is actually go back and watch his stuff I feel very privileged to have been able to experience his career over the course of it happening and actually seeing it live and seeing what he's actually done. Do I feel regrets about not talking to him more? I would say yes, but it's it's not like I've really been talking to anybody. I, you know, the ego thing again, thinking about when I die, what's anybody gonna say? I think like, not a whole lot. It's gonna be a very meager, funeral procession it's gonna be pathetic it's, it's not going to matter at all but i could live vicariously uh through michael brooks so 
I'll just pretend that I was him and that will make things better. But no, like I said, just a person that I was happy to see out there who I didn't feel the need to interact with more because I just wanted to see how he progressed and what he went on to. People were saying he managed to meet some of the items on his bucket list. He was obsessed by Lula da Silva, um, the former Brazilian president who should legitimately be the president but was put in prison based on a corrupt investigation um, by a government official who went on to help Jair Bolsonaro, the current uh, dictatorial right-wing president of Brazil who has killed thousands of people by not caring about coronavirus and who will continue to do so. Sincerely speaking, people say I am a radical. I am not a radical. I am more human. I learned how to be more human in jail. I reflect more. I looked over my 70 years of life and realized that I have to fight more. I have to argue more. I have to. You cannot accept the idea that the Brazilian elites don't accept the economic growth of the poor. They don't accept that the poor can have the right to health care, education, water, school, everything that can feed them. They don't accept that the poor have these things. So I am not radical, Brian. I have a lot more political consciousness. And for this reason, I want to fight a lot more. Oh, but Lula wants to come back. Lula got out of jail angry. Lula got out of jail and now he wants to polarize. I really want to polarize. I want to make deep ideological debates. I want the people to know that there is no teaching anywhere that says a person has to go three days without food. There is no teaching that says that a person should wake up in their morning and not have a cup of milk or a piece of bread to give their child in a rich country like this one. So this is why it looks like I am more angry. It looks like I am a radical, but I am not. And Michael's also very interested in Adolf Reed, who I don't know anything about. That, that this notion that politics is, is about displaying um, who, who deserves to go to heaven and, uh, who, who, and uh, who deserves to go to hell, right. or, or it's like pledging a fret, right? You got to show that you, you accept like, all, all, all the core beliefs to be part of our movement is absolutely self-defeating, and it just feels... I don't know. Um, well, I guess I do feel kind of comfortable, as I said to Nathan Robinson, saying this like in this city. But but it just feels like a, a way too Protestant approach, like the politics for me. It's way too Protestant. Obviously, I think it was a Jewish and Catholic background. We could align on that. Uh, oh, absolutely, <laughs> totally. So, well, yeah. Well, I tell you, I've got a good 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 friend who has long said you have two choices with, with your kids: you can either raise them Catholic or Jewish, or they might turn out religious. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Adolf Reed, thank you so much for doing this. Please come back again soon. Oh, man, I'd love to do it as soon as you want. So, uh, so I mean, thanks again for having me, Michael. Cornell West, who's a great fighter for social justice. I don't want to get into the identity stuff one way or another as a straight white Bernie bro. <laughs> but some of the conversation that gets slotted in that category is really just toxicity that has nothing to do with the spe specific mm. set of politics one way or another. And that's something that I wanted to be much more attentive to, including in my own work and how I talk about people and how I think about things. Mm. And so, you know, it was, and, and even I had peers, one really good friend of mine, he used to, he said, man, Cornell West is a hater. You know, I do, I do hate yes. injustice. I do hate it. Oh, you know what? He got me right. That's right. Oh, he got me right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hate occupation. That's right. I hate exploitation. Oh, yeah, I'm a hater, and that's it. And then, and then <laughs> six months ago, we're in a conversation. We're recording something. He said, did you hear that Mehdi Hassan interview with Cornell West? I said, yeah. He said, Mike, he's the best in the game. <laughs> because, but I think there is something about looking at the consistency and the core and the grappling and then 
you can measure people by that. And then, yes, you can. And then, and then when there is a pile on, or there is a stupid argument, or somebody is being, you can look at it and say, do I, it's like in Bolivia right now. It's taken on a much bigger level. Mm. It's a coup. Do you want to say, like, oh, I don't know, it's complicated, and then in four <laughs> years go, you know, I just watched a Netflix documentary. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to That's say, exactly yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it's a coup. Right. Now. All right, everyone. And Noam Chomsky, who he got to interview. This sounds strong, but it's true. He is the worst criminal in human history. Undeniably, there has never been a figure in political history who was dedicated with passion to destroying the prospects for organized human life on Earth in the near future. That is not an exaggeration. Uh, people are focused now on the protests on the pandemic. They're, they're bad enough. The pandemic is serious enough. We will emerge from it at terrible cost. The cost is greatly amplified by the gangster in the White House who's killed tens of thousands of Americans. So it'll be very, I'm making this the worst place in the world in response to it. But we will emerge. We're not going to emerge from another crime that Trump is committing, the heating of the globe, global heating, the global roasting, which it's coming to. We're not going to emerge from that. It's a, it's a very serious business. So Michael was concerned mostly about big ideas, the biggest ideas. I kind of feel like Michael died at a place of peace. It's obviously, it's not good to die at any time, um, to be sure. But he could have died at a worse time. He could have died when Donald Trump wins re-election. And I really hope for his sake that that's not the case because just before Michael died, he thought that Donald Trump's going to lose. And he was so excited for Joe Biden. At least Michael didn't live to see climate change kill everything and everyone. That's something. And it really shows that you can't take for granted the fact that you might suddenly die just for no reason. Michael, so much unfulfilled potential He'd already accomplished so much, but like, I think that was just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what he was going to achieve. I've seen people arguing online because um, some people said, well, he was this generation's Noam Chomsky. And other people saying, no, he wasn't. How dare you? He was nowhere near as important or intelligent or as influential as Noam Chomsky. And I would be um, liable to agree with the people who disagree that he's this generation's Noam Chomsky. But you saw how much he was progressing and where he was going and the maturity that was building so rapidly in his thinking that I think maybe like 20 years from now or something like that, when he was like 57, I think he would be coming into his own so much intellectually. And it could be that he would be just like a late bloomer in that sense, but he's far beyond what just your average person on the internet is saying like the people on the internet saying oh he was nowhere near noam chomsky or what have you well if michael was nowhere near noam chomsky you are nowhere nowhere near <laughs> noam chomsky i think if someone had potential to turn into that kind of figure it was michael so that like that's what makes this so fucking tragic and insulting to be honest that reality would be this cruel so fuck you reality you're a fucking punk. Michael had only just written his first book, and I just downloaded it. Before he died, I thought to myself, I need to download Michael Brooks' book, and I need to read it, because I really want to read it. And I swear that's not bullshit. I did want to get his book. I have his book now, and I have his book now because he died. So it makes it seem like that I got his book just because he died. That's not true. The only thing his death did in regards to his book is make me get it sooner than I would have gotten it. If he hadn't have died, I'm pretty sure I would have gotten it. 
in about two to three weeks from now. This is the book here, Michael Brooks Against the Web, A Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right. And this picture here parodies the famous intellectual dark web dinner where it's like Ben Shapiro and Sam Harris and, and uh, Dave Rubin? Yeah, he was there um, just having dinner. But Michael Brooks is there. Only 96 pages. Why do I find this so insulting and frustrating? Because I also have this book. It's called Don't Burn This Book. Thinking for Yourself in an Age of Unreason by Dave Rubin. This fucking thing is like 250 something pages. I'm only halfway through and I've been reading it for like three weeks. And I have to say that my brain is still in recovery mode from taking in so many high level important ideas. It's torturous. How come Michael Brooks' book is so short and easy to read? But fucking Dave Rubin's book's like 250 something and it, it's taking weeks to read this fucking piece of crap. It's not fair. If the dial of ideas was turned to low for the last few years, it's quickly moving into the hot position. So I just wish Michael Brooks' book was longer. I got this book for the sake of reviewing it. I still haven't finished it because it's so hard to fucking read because it's so bad. But I'm gonna finish Michael's book in about five minutes. Fuck life. So I don't really know how to sum up Michael Brooks' career. That's impossible to do. Very thoughtful, very nuanced person who cared about such a wide range of topics. I don't think I could do that. But I can leave you with something that he was famous for because it's something that was so incredible and so awesome. And that's his amazing range of impressions of different people. I might forget some, and if I do, I apologize. But he had so many impressions that I don't think I could really summarize all of them. The most famous one, I think, was right-wing Nelson Mandela. Hey, I'll let you have the last word, Rick Santorum. Got up against a great injustice and, and was willing to pay a, a huge price for that, and that's the reason he's, he's, he's mourned today, because of that, of that struggle that he, he, he performed. But but you're right. I mean, what he was advocating for was was not necessarily the the right answer, but he was fighting against some some great injustice. And and I would make the argument that you know we have a great injustice going on right now in this country with uh, with with an ever increasing size of government that is taking over and controlling people's lives. And Obamacare is front and center in that. And and I there you have it, folks. Obamacare is like apartheid. Obamacare is like the repression. Literal repression the, uh, of the majority of Americans. Americans under Obamacare, uh, a vast majority of them, uh, can't eat in the same restaurants, must live in slums, uh, can't have access to the natural resources of their country, cannot uh, have an equal vote, cannot have... I mean, that's what Obamacare is for Rick Santorum because he's so, so stupid. Yeah, you want to do uh, yeah. Mandela? It was like, it was like in Santorum's mind, Mandela comes out and he's like, of all of the injustices in the world, that could remind me of the struggle against apartheid. The delivery of health care <laughs> through a private market mechanism. <laughs> None could face the same level of injustice and tyranny <laughs> that Americans face by having an inconvenient website <laughs> so that they are covered in a catastrophic situation. You should fight this. Now, I want to know, when's Rick Santorum going to go into prison for 27 years to fight this? Unbelievable. The names Santorum, Gingrich, and other heroes of the struggle <laughs> against the slightly expanded Medicaid. <laughs> you will go down in the in history along with Ada Vertambo, <laughs> Walter Sinsulu, and other great comrades who have fought an like evil injustice. <laughs> How demented are these people? <laughs> so it's, demented. It's so much better if they could just say Mandela was a communist. Screw him. Oh, I mean, it, like, my God. Right. But Sam, I am troubled 
by a lack of seriousness in the GOP field that I see. Really? All of these candidates are true patriots who clearly would like to save America from the destructive liberal socialist tendencies of President Obama. However, I see a lack of seriousness when it comes to foreign policy and family values that is lacking in the field. Really? What is it that you uh, feel is lacking specifically? I think, as I say, a, a measure of seriousness when it came to foreign policy and a willingness to confront the Islamic threat. See, many people don't recognize, Sam, that there is evil in the world. <laughs> no, I think people, yeah. I think that's probably. And I uh, think true. if you look at my, you don't think that the Republican experience set and skills that I bring to the table. As so I wait continue, a second. Are you suggesting that uh, you, I know, right that, wing Nelson Mandela, are going to run for the Republican primary nomination? I know that liberal hosts like to interrupt and be disrespectful, <laughs> and I will be painted into a corner. Comments I made about Buju Banton being correct about gay people will be distorted. All sorts of things will come my way. But I have received a message from God <laughs> saying that I must run. So God. So is it is today that I am announcing later <laughs> that I will formally create an exploratory <laughs> committee to see if a run could be what this country needs to save it from creeping socialism. Wow. An open border. And terrorists at our front door who do no longer believe in American strength. It is breaking news. Right wing Nelson Mandela has announced that later today he will announce that he's going to announce an exploratory committee. An exploratory, that is correct. God has told me to fill out the water. They can't forget Nation of Islam Obama. And then the other uh, part of this uh, program is that we also have an opportunity to bring Obama in and actually get it's more specific. It's not enough to hate the white man. You need to know how to take, him, take over his businesses, throw him out of his homes, right. defile his daughters, right. and destroy his religion. Right. We can stand here and we can listen to Brand Nubian and we can listen to the brother minister preach, but if we don't burn down Whitey's home, <laughs> we don't terrorize Whitey on the street then we're not going to have the results that we uh, fundamentally want to see. That's right. A lot of walk bar. So the idea is just to, don't just be um, uh, passionate, but actually get out there and do stuff that's don't really going to be Don't just be talking really about how upset. Whitey controls the vaccine supply in your dorm crossing. room. <laughs> get out on the street. Burn down a home. Carjack a car. In L.A. in 1992, they didn't sit back and bemoan what happened to Rodney King. They burned down the yellow man's laundry mats. That's what we need to do today. Hmm. We've gone a little, a little far. I don't know why we don't have video of that part of the speech, but... <laughs> Uh, all right, let's go to the phones. They can't forget anti-SJW Martin Luther King Jr. Special treatment of some at the exclusion of others. This misguided principle is the essence of prejudice, which means to prejudge. Oh, this prejudge, is the I get reverse. it. Don't prejudge. Pre that's a great, that's a great f***ing point. Prejudice comes from prejudge. Don't no, exclude no. the white two people. That, was, words that was the point of the letter from Alabama from the Birmingham jail. Mm. And now these SJWs on campus won't engage in a free exchange of ideas well, when they're not busy killing hear, arrows. Was, this overall message of the ad embodied Dr. King's philosophy that true greatness is achieved by, achieved by serving others. Thus, we decided to be part of Rams Built to Serve Super Bowl program. That fiat money <laughs> is good, <laughs> folks. If you can buy a Ram truck, then four you can four. participate. Four by four. Global warming, fuck that. It's a Chinese hoax. I'm trying to get this cash money, motherfuckers. People have a problem with my state using my words for a Ram ad. Well, it's like you can't say anything anymore on TV, I swear, Joe. People are joining the alt-right 
because my words won't be used for ram ads. <laughs> you don't like my ram? You can grab my truck nuts. <laughs> I have a clear message for them. Suck on this. <laughs> People also can't forget Bernie, bro, Bill Clinton. Sam. Yes. Can't vote for my wife. You can't. I'm sorry. Is this? Look uh, at all the polls. We should get. She's not going to beat Trump. This phone call that you just patched through. Is this, this a, was Bill Clinton calling? This is Bill Clinton. Oh, hi, Bill. It's funny that you would call. Look, Sam. I feel like you've been very dismissive of the Bernie or bust crowd, and oh. you haven't taken seriously the numerous voter allegations of fraud and the Associated Press colluding with my wife's campaign. Now you got to understand something here. It's mm-hmm. crucial. There are over 30 FBI agents investigating my wife right now. You don't think that doesn't end up in an indictment? I, it, She's going to lose to Trump. <laughs> Shillery, release the transcript. <laughs> it is odd that uh, that Bill Clinton would be a Bernie or Buster. I think well, people I, were surprised to hear that. I mean, if she couldn't satisfy me, could she satisfy the country? <laughs> Hashtag Bernie or Bust. <laughs> I mean, look, look. Just odd. You know, the thing is, you say, vote for the lesser two evils. Well, guess what? I don't want to vote for evil anymore. I see. <laughs> and the other thing about it is, see, 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 here's the deal. With Hillary, you know what you're getting. She's a war criminal. <laughs> She's in the pockets of the banks. Mm-hmm. She dines with Lloyd Blankfein every day, and he's a very nasty, disgusting little man. <laughs> He actually makes Donald Trump look quite handsome if wow. we're keeping it at 100. Look, so wow, there's if a lot we're being of honest, people have been honest. using that phrase today. It's yeah, weird. It's going around. It's traveling around the ether. I guess so. It's Stop out there. interrupting my flow. Go ahead. So you know we're getting with her. Right. right? Are we right? Well, war, um, kill Arabs, take money from the banks. That's what we get with Hillary. Right. Donald Trump, we don't know. We don't know. It could be better. We don't know. He could be better. He the could. revolution could happen, and he's good on TPP. So I look at all that, and I say to myself, I don't want to Well, Hillary has come out for TPP. I mean, she, it's, it's been a position change. Do you change, believe but... a word that my wife says? <laughs> well, she is a liar. I mean... She's the greatest liar in the history of American politics. Well, what am I supposed to do? Shillery. Okay. Hashtag Shillery. All right. Release I appreciate the phone call. The Wall Street transcripts. And I've respected the majority report in the past, but you're not covering rampant voter fraud, California. There's at least 10 million Bernie voters. They're not being reported. He's actually won this thing by a landslide. And when the FBI indicts, you're going to regret it. Okay. Well, I I appreciate that. Bernie or Bud. They can't forget evil Bernie Sanders or Sanders. However you say that. Every dollar that I tax a high-frequency trade and <laughs> direct it to education, I get off on the immorality of it. I get off on the, the pure fucking immorality of it. <laughs> that Wall Street money turned to a free college. It makes me hard. It's so sick. <laughs> it's so wrong. I'm trying to, like, look up. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Then you get rid of medical debt and you invest it in green jobs. You know how f- depraved that is? I'm going to be I, so I, I bad. Should, We're going to be so Now, hold sick. on. I should know this off the top of my head, <clears throat> but... Or Chris Matthews. Chris Matthews, though. You can go back. He's one of these, like, you know, you don't always agree, but, you know, George Bush, he's in the cowboy boots, oh, and yeah, he yeah, is yeah, who no, he no, is. Yes. And Al Gore is always, you know, one month it's technology. Now he's a friend of the workers. Who is he? And Matthews has this like little bo- like look on his face, like a little bunny, and he's just like, "Oh my God, I'm thinking something, I'm thinking something." Look at it, look at it, it's right there. I'm thinking something, I'm thinking something. I should say it, but I want to say it, but I'm on MSNBC. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Oh my God, what am I gonna do? Tulsi Gabbard, raisins. Actually, he was enormously well behaved. I have to say, by his standards, could very easily see like a. Him becoming a... Why why don't people vote for fucking Tulsi Gabbard? Jesus Christ, the pure, sheer human beauty. (laughs) Do you remember when he got caught on tape, uh, hot mic, talking about how hot Melania was? First he said that she walks like a model. Right, that seems perfect. Which we caught, and that's innocuous enough. And then later he says, I could watch that for, like, all day. Yeah. (laughs) And, um... 
I, uh, is, it, is it confirmed as to who was saying that? Was it one of those uh, guys who work in the back? I oh, my God. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, now. This woman's practically giving me a heart attack. Now, listen. <laughs> I, want to, I want to offer um, the benefit of the doubt here. It's very possible Chris Matthews is a huge fan of shows like Project Runway. <laughs> and uh, he goes to... Tim Gunn. He, oh, Melania. That being from another realm, yet the perfection of this realm. Oh, my God. Barack put a thrill at my leg, <laughs> and this is putting a sensation down my abdomen. It's totally overwhelming. <laughs> they would be very different lovers, but good in their own individual ways. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Available for hardball still. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was going to say. They can't forget Sam Cedar. There's no I got doubt no, about that. I got no, you know, look, look, everybody. You're talking Botox? Yeah. And, and it's just like, look, here's the thing. Sam always does the same Botox preamble. Like, no, judge me, but you got Botox. No, Ooh, no. Somebody it's, 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 it's no judgment, but here's the thing. And I say this, my. Somebody's uh, imploding. My. About his wife. Don't, don't worry, Michael. I have uh, spent the evening on a whiteboard where I have uh, b drawn out both the A, B, and C projections of Social Security, and I am introducing actually a fourth projection that is uh, developed from an algorithm of the percentage in which uh, past, uh, past projections about the solvency of the trust fund have been off. And so when I invent this and uh, present it as option D, uh, you'll see the majority report will be completely solvent and will be all covered. Well, Serge. So meta to hear you do an impression of Michael's of Michael impression doing an impression of, of me. Yeah, I know. They can't forget gangster Ben Carson. A lot of people around here trying to pretend like they love the country when well, all they've been doing is hating it. Deceitful, lying liberal media. And we all know that their transgender bathrooms are making kids addicted to crack. I was the only one with the courage to say this. Uh, I'm not a business man. I am a business man. I'm multiple levels like mana tech, biotech, like old nutrients, and they'll send me checks. Cause I'm blessed, cause I'm blessed by God. This is why the media calls me a fraud. Just stop, just stop. Boy, I'll stab you like I stabbed my friend when he turned down my tune and hit his belt buckle. So I ran to the bathroom. When I got there, I heard God in my head. So I locked the door and here's what he said. Joseph built pyramids to store the grain because the pharaohs had trouble making it rain. As president, this is what you need to explain. The first to take the scalpel to the liberal media brains. To their liberal media brains. They can't forget Mini Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> I'm sorry, I really, I know how I get addicted to these things sometimes, but there is just something hysterical about him politely explaining what is and isn't in the NDA yeah. that just kills me. <laughs> oh, it doesn't mean you have to <laughs> stop talking for the rest yeah, yeah. of your life. Oh, no, don't worry. It's not like a permanent gag order. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the absolutely disgusting thing that I said. I mean, well, yeah. you can still it. talk to your, death. You can still talk to your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody says like, "Oh, you can't go to a baseball game." <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, Brendan. Please just make your point. No, I thought you were even. No, I mean, this, I, yeah. It's, yeah, his his concept of an NDA too is just so ridiculous that like they don't want to talk about this, like. No, you gave them a ton of money, and you're going to kill them if they do. Yeah, that's why they have. That's why you have to make. Well, them she doesn't it. want to talk about it either, because frankly, the, my comment was, "Oh my God, Amber used to be a fantastic piece of ass. Not after she's pregnant, so that could be embarrassing." Yeah, I don't. mean, I wouldn't want to say that myself, but that could be embarrassing for her. So you know, it's really a win-win for everybody. They don't want to talk about it, so to be good guys, we may <laughs> we give them lots of money to never ever talk about it. <laughs> 
It's being pro worker. That's right. <laughs> That's one of my pro worker policies. Eat your heart out, Bernie Sanders. You're calling from a 516 area code with the final call of the day. Who are you? Where are you calling from? You can't forget the libertarian king of being a son of someone who was libertarian, Rand Paul. With regard to the idea of whether or not you have a right to a health care, you have to realize what that implies. It's not an abstraction. I'm a physician. That means you have so a right to come to my house and conscript me. It means you believe in <laughs> slavery. It means that you're going to enslave not only me, but the janitor the at my hospital, you, the, aides. the person who cleans my <laughs> office, the assistants like, who I'm work in sure my office. I'm not sure how this is sounding. <laughs> if you have a right to their services, basically once you imply a belief in a right to someone's services, do you have a right to plumbing? Do you have a right to water? Do you have a right yes. to food? Yes. You're basically yes. saying that you believe in slavery. You're okay, so first of all, uh, check, check, check. Definitely everybody has a right to health care, food, water, and, and uh, I forget what else he mentioned, but plumbing. yes, absolutely. What? Plumbing. Well, that's an interesting specific one. I would say yes. I don't know if that usually comes as a standalone. You have the right to a supercharged plumber or yeah. plunger. <laughs> yeah. That means you can go into the store, apprehend a plunger without paying for it, and then hold the entire uh, Home Depot aisle hostage and turn them into slaves. <clears throat> Do you have a letter from the king authorizing this act of acquisition? There's an underground railroad of uh, doctors fleeing Canada coming to the United yeah. States. <laughs> like, oh, Lord, I've been marching on my feet for days. He does like these new spirituals. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> you're like, you can force me to vaccinate a child, but you will not break my spirit. We're going, Lord, to the underground railroad or we will be free. <laughs> <laughs> the guy's like, you will give the paleo vaccine to that young man, boy. No. Ah. Of course, who could forget Dr. Sebastian Gorka? With who these African African Americans. Well, Afri and then that's mm. yes, yes, African American. Yes, go to Chicago I'm Zaire. Sorry. You I'm will so discover quickly what I am talking I'm about. sorry, did I say that out loud? Did I say black Africans? The black Africans because who must be managed in Rhodesia yes. by a great leader like <laughs> Ian Smith. Oh, am I oh, on no. mic? <laughs> Excuse oh, me. Oh, my. Pardon me. That's what I said. B African, black African Americans. Black Africans. The black. soul of darkness, of soul. blackness in black. Chicago. With their black skin and their Did black Did I mention their black, black eyes. They're black. They're black. They're blackity, 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 black, black, black. I mean, legislation won't work. Legislation won't help with the blacks Black unless Africans. you could legislate basketball instead of shooting. We've got to have Anyone? An African basketball. African basketball so they can play with each other by the bushel instead of shoot each other by the bushel. <laughs> Go to by Chicago, Congo. Go to Chicago, Congo. The facts speak oh, for themselves. I'm sorry. I thought this was Sinclair Media. I thought no, this was... all of a sudden that's bad for me to say. Oh, black I Africans. thought apparently I triggered the lady mm. on the panel. I thought this was so Sinclair, fake. not Oberlin. Yes. We are not just a superpower. We were a superpower. We are now a hyperpower. Nobody in the world, especially not North Korea comes close to challenging our military capabilities, whether they're conventional, whether they're nuclear, or whether they're special forces. We have turned it up to 11. So when we look over at uh, North Korea, which is like a four at best, we established all of these 11. parameters very clearly and mm. succinctly at the Mar-a-Lago summit. Yes, at the Mar-a-Lago summit, we, did, we took a hyperpower meter and plugged it into the earth. <laughs> we found that we're an 11 on the hyperpower. Stephen Miller has the highest hyperpower level that you can have on a personal energy rating of an 8.5. My God, I hope the Chiron says hyperpower <laughs> so I can get this in the propaganda document. I have been winning the Chiron war the whole time, which is why I wasn't fired. These fools Ooh. around me have no understanding of how it works. They can't forget yeah, Ben Shapiro. The uh, the uh, the the cool kids philosopher in the words of the New York Times found that quote, and he said this: Soleimani was he quote tweeted Emma Viglin. Soleimani was one of the leading terrorists on the planet. Was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans. Was planning further attacks on Americans and was on foreign soil doing so. Spot on comparison there, Sparky. 
<laughs> okay, and then should I just read all of these before you? Uh... Let's, let's just go through them. Okay, them. and then Emma responded. Your nativism is amusing. Trump, Obama, and Bush all committed war crimes. Should they be assassinated on the spot? Question mark, right? Are you aware of, and uh, the only thing I would add to Emma is that one of those answers for little Benny might be in doubt, but we'll get back to that at another time. <laughs> are you aware of how many deaths Trump and Pompeo are directly responsible for? Civilian deaths, or do you not care because they're Arabs who quote live in open sewage with the Which deep cut. I will, yeah, I will interject there to say that that's a quote from a classic Ben Shapiro tweet, uh, where he said, if I remember from memory, um, uh, the difference between um, Israelis and Palestinians, or I think he just said Arabs. Uh, is that uh, Israelis like to build things and uh, Arabs like to live in open sewage. Hashtag settlements rock. Yup. And of course, that's on uh, Ben Shapiro's uh, long email, long uh, blog, blog uh, uh, web chain of uh, things that you can't criticize me for anymore because I've made insincere apologies about. They can't forget Jordan Peterson. Oh, my. Because Apple cider. Like, what, what was it doing? It. What was it doing to you? <laughs> oh, it, it, it produced an overwhelming sense of impending doom <laughs> and i seriously been overwhelming like there's no way i could have lived like that if that would have lasted for see michaela knew by that point that it would probably only last a month and i was like a month yeah my <laughs> fucking cider <laughs> oh i didn't sleep that that month i didn't sleep for 25 days yeah you would be I didn't dead. sleep what? at all you'd be dead I didn't sleep at all for 25 days dead. how is that possible that, that, that i'll tell you how it's possible you lay in bed <laughs> Uh, frozen in something approximating <laughs> terror for eight hours, and then you get up. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Not and good. this is from <laughs> fucking sight. <laughs> That's what we thought, yeah. The funny thing he does there is he takes any sort of hinted skepticism as, uh, like, he's asking for further detail. Yeah, I know. It's like, <laughs> oh, you want to know more about it? You fucking meathead more. He's all, I like how he's, like, doing a little bit of subtext, like, oh, you don't know about sulfite, you fucking gorilla? Uh, I'll tell you, you big dumb fuck. Twenty-five days? Yeah, we thought it would. Oh, yeah, my daughter thought it'd only be twenty-five days. Rogan's like, twenty-five days? Like only be twenty-five days? What are you talking? about? Yeah, my daughter predicted that neither of us would sleep for two weeks because we both don't know how fucking serious cider is. What part of this are you not understanding, you big dumb righted up monkey motherfucker? <laughs> Best defense, good offense. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been um, breaking out into fever sweats uh, every night for the past month, and I'm pretty sure it's, it has nothing to do with my all T-bone steak diet, and it's all the cider that I had uh, earlier in the month. So basically, I eat beef jerky. I've turned my class into an induction seminar for weird self-help, borderline fascistic knockoff Jungian theories. I only eat T-bone steaks. And having a glass of cider, if you took me literally, has produced such a state of hysteria in me that it's actually allowed me to live through the physically impossible. And the conclusion that I draw from all of that as a psychiatrist, as a psychologist, is that I should travel the Western world and teach young men how to live. <laughs> in, that, in, that, in that time that I wasn't sleeping for 25 days because of a, a glass of cider, I live streamed for about 500 hours. And <laughs> it actually produce some great insights about different ways that I could harass people because of their gender identities. <laughs> if this Jordan Peterson thing just... They can't forget uh, Sam Harris. That would be the Sam Harris, right? It's like, I mean, then you have Harriet Beecher Stowe, and of course I condemn the Ku Klux Klan, but she is the moral equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan. Man, if all of these people were on Twitter at the time, all of their feeds would literally just be slavery should end, but yeah. like Lincoln is divisive. Harriet Beecher Stowe is an SJW. Is Frederick Douglass secretly a Mohammedan? <laughs> that, would, that would be the whole fucking feed. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, I understand Frederick Douglass making a lot of the right noises, but I have a lot of concern about what it actually means when the Negro actually is in the main house. And I shouldn't be condemned for saying that. Civil War era Sam Harris. Oh, man. <laughs> Right. There's More definitely a your... guy that is just that, that literally existed back then that was totally. doing just that. Totally. And that's what they're doing. 
my terror, my my racial paranoia is perfectly justifiable right. along long rational lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You're not understanding. They actually, they no, no, no. They put the brain. They, they had people from Africa that they put in a zoo and they observed them for science. You can't argue with facts. I get that. I get that slavery is bad, but on one hand, we have an escaped slave that <laughs> cut the throat of a young farmer girl. And so what do you have to say about that? Yeah. So in other words, we need to take this seriously. Okay. Nat Turner hurt a lot of people. People that were offering to give him water. Okay, so in other words, I, no, no, I agree with you. Slavery is wrong. But if we don't deal with the fact that Nat Turner led an uprising, then we're not being morally serious. <laughs> Do you want another Haiti here? <laughs> <laughs> and there was many more, but the piece de la resistance, the beauty. I'm going to remember other impressions that he did and be annoyed that I forgot to include them. But this one, Dave Rubin, seemed a bit ableist the way I said that. Dave Rubin. What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Bolsonaro, uh, Bolsonaro uh, regarding? <laughs> can you can you just play that again? Can we just do that again? What is your opinion on Brazilian Prime Minister uh, Bolsonaro? <laughs> Uh, regarding, oops, there's a lot of things moving here. Deforestation of the rainforest. P.S. I'm a Christian. I bake you a cake, though. Uh, you know, I don't know enough about him, um, but it sounds like he really hates Marxism and he's and he's really pushing Brazil to become more of a world leader, and that he actually is for capitalism and he's trying to get some of the SJW stuff out of the schools. I just saw a tweet by him a day or two ago. So on that front, and I, as again, I don't know a ton about him. That all sounds good to me. Um, and as a, as a Christian, I, I appreciate your offer to bake me a cake. Uh, wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I say this as someone that was, you know, that I still consider myself liberal, but I'm, I'm a <laughs> lifetime Democrat, crazy. really, at least until the last two or so years. Um, a lot of that's coming out of the left and from the Democrats, this labeling of everyone as racist. Well, I hear you and you're leaving out a very important factor which is that the president, at least based on his tweets and his comments, <laughs> is. So I agree with you that uh, a smug, self-righteous, intolerant left-winger is no less dangerous to the emotional fabric of our country than a smug, self-righteous, intolerant right-winger. And some of the shutdown, you shut up, you didn't say the right thing, comes from the left as much as the right these days. I will give you that. And it's dangerous and it's wrong. However, this president says things and is involved in it right now, which by any, by any measure are racist comments. Um, Who knew? Where else he has nowhere to go because she's completely disarmed. His, all he has is that shtick because, in my opinion, 100% he is a racist, in my opinion, and he on 100% a conduit for all of these things, knowingly or unknowingly. It could be unknowingly because he's clearly to me an extremely dim guy but she's got he's got nowhere else to go now so what does he we'll see where he goes and then where else were you going with that I can't well, well do you find it sort of almost impossible to have any kind of political conversation that doesn't get whittled <laughs> well, down yeah. to this because that sort of seems yeah. like where we're at I don't even really know who's talking about policy anymore or or really what I would rather talk about all day long which is how much Minor point, <laughs> you, you've trapped a Democratic candidate in your little studio. Talk policy, Dave. Yeah, I don't know, Dave, your, the Dave, same Dave thing this is a great about. opportunity. I mean, I'm sure you've got some really serious questions like, about I, how to implement, get Medicare for all. I hate talking about how you know, censorious the left is every single episode of my show. Yeah, I, I mean, love it's, the just such a, it's so boring Wouldn't to talk nice? about how moralistic the left at SJWs. I mean, there's literally... One or two other things I'd like to vaguely talk about. Which government is needed to do anything? See any more, or or really what I would rather talk about all day long, which is how much government is needed to do anything, yeah, which I think would be a rich I don't place know. to I have a discussion. I think it's more complicated than that. I think we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, on what? one hand, I certainly understand. When slavery was abolished in this country, the U.S. government promised, because there were four to five million slaves at that time, the, the U.S. government promised that every former enslaved 
person family of four would receive between uh, uh, 40 acres and a mule that would have given people who all right we got we got go. but i just love this just jesus no, that's amazing. look at this dope taking it on <laughs> And it's so perfect because she's treat she is treating him like a kind of like dense but eager pupil. Oh, that's great. I mean, little did Dave realize that I mean, look, it's not gonna be the same dunk fest as if I or, you know, Sam or Benjamin Dixon or, you know, Anna Kasparian. Well, particularly Anna Kasparian. <laughs> But, like, uh, this is a dunk. I don't think he was expecting, like, oh, look, I have Marion Williamson, and then I can pretend that I'm open-minded. I don't think he was expecting. And, and this is also a reason genuinely why I, you know, I frankly oppose underestimating her. I think she's bringing something very valid to the table here. Okay, I'll be there. Pause it. I just I have love to say, you. now, you think after it's, it's sweet, I think he's talking to his son, it He's sounds been enormously rude, and it sounds like his son actually is trying to wrap the call up. <laughs> yes. So let's see where this goes now, because you, you think you can sense Dave's sense of relief coming. You can sense Dave. Dave. What I also love, and my my guess is, is that Dave is the type of guy who stupidly grins, but is like seething oh, inside. Yeah. It's like I'm getting disrespected in my own set. Check this out. Here's it. How about Friday night? All right. The night before your doubleheader. <laughs> I'll be at both games. Okay, I'll be there. I love you, Ken. Aw. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. What? I'm a, what? No, what? Today? That's great. The Dodgers got Mookie Betts and David Price today. You're breaking, you're breaking news for me, man. He's so mad. I, that's so tremendous. Mad. Who did they... Look at his face oh here. Oh, my God. Today? That's great. The Dodgers got Mookie Betts and David Price today. You're breaking You're breaking news for me, man. That wasn't a real I, sip that's of water. Tr and David... <laughs> today? <laughs> That's great. The Dodgers got Mookie Betts and David Price today. You're breaking, you're breaking news for me, man. I, that's tremendous. Who did they give up for them? <laughs> Nikes and suspenders. Pure disrespect. Oh, no, that's two pretty good players. Get to my Ada can picture. Alex Verdugo is going to be a star. So, Peterson, is there someone going from the Angels to the Red Sox? <laughs> so there's no way that I could really sum up Michael Brooks' life or career. I feel like it's just something that you must have experienced yourself to really understand what a special, wonderful, amazing, intelligent, talented person he was. The thing that really was touching to me is the fact that I could listen to him basically every day and feel a kinship and feel a connection and feel something that was important and not just the daily nonsense and the daily grind. You know, there's all kinds of other commentators I listen to that I, I like and I appreciate, but they don't have that kind of effect on me. like. I feel like I'm listening to somebody who really cares and who, I, again, who I feel a connection to even though I don't know them. So I'm going to miss hearing Michael Brooks' voice every day. I'm going to miss him. I want to be inspired by his legacy. I want to feel less pessimistic. I want to feel less powerless, like I have no voice, that I can't connect to people and I can't talk to people and I can't make um, the kind of reality and existence that I want to. I want to try to use his legacy for the positive and remember Michael Brooks. Like, even if others uh, forget him or didn't know him or know who he was, if I can live through some of the things that he did, I'm going to feel happy. 
but it does help me to appreciate life a little bit more and think about what kind of legacy I might want to leave, even if it would be a very small and insignificant and unimportant legacy. And if that legacy could be a little bit bigger and a little bit better because of Michael Brooks, I'd like to think that Michael Brooks had some positive influence. So if I can live that out myself, and if other people can live that out, maybe we can build a little bit of a better world and we can get to that wonderful place that Michael would have wanted where Joe Biden is president. Michael Brooks dream. People talk about it being a loss for the left, but I really don't see it that way because it's a little bit, I don't know, ideological to just be like, the only thing we're really concerned about is uh, left wingery and what he meant for that. I, I just bond the fact that he was just such a fantastic person, someone I respect so much, who he's gone so before his time. I just want to end it on a positive note of saying I, I love Michael Brooks. He will always be one of my biggest inspirations. Um, I'll never forget him. And just what he did is going to inspire me for the rest of my life. I don't know how long that's going to be. You know, one thing that Michael showed, although he didn't obviously didn't want to show that, is that you never know how long you've got. I'll leave you with a clip from what I think is Michael's last show. It really goes to show you the kind of person he was right to the end of his life. This is just the kind of thing he talked about every day because he was just such a kind, conscientious, intelligent person with such a wide vision for what social justice needs to look like for the world. And that's what he was thinking right until the end. Let's talk about ending hunger. You know, I was inspired last week. And if you haven't watched yet, please watch the conversation with the great Vijay Prashad where he spoke about the context of defund the police, the racist history of America, the class context, and the very simple notion that we use policing in his terminology to get in between people and food, the basic necessities of life. And I want to bring back this very, very simple and core concept. We should have a global campaign in the United States and every corner of the world to completely get rid of every single form of hunger. Let's do that. Let's have that very, very clear, very, very basic and human and universal goal for every single human on this planet. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I could tell you as someone, and again, and be very, very clear here, infinitely more uh, sort of safe and privileged than most, but, my family did experience at certain for, at times some forms of food insecurity. And even those most mild things where it was never really, really going to be an issue, maybe a missed meal here, missed meal there, the anxiety, the pain of that, the depth of that is something that absolutely no one should experience. And of course, many, many human beings do. In fact, the numbers have been increasing. There's an estimated 775 million undernourished people in 2014. By 2008, that estimate had increased to 820 million. Hunger is on the rise. The UN estimates that the COVID crisis will lead to an additional 83 to 1 point to 132 million undernourished people. UN agencies have, all, have also made the argument that the international poverty threshold of $1.90 a day is not enough to afford a healthy diet. Three million people cannot afford healthy diet according to the UN. This is very important actually, that figure. That's the figure that the World Bank and others with a kind of Panglossian view have deployed to downplay the significance, the resilience, than the absolute massive burden of the amount of deeply impoverished and hungry people across this planet. And of course, this problem is not in any way exclusive to the underdeveloped world. Let's look at the United States, a world leader in inequality and poverty, even as it is the world's main superpower. The money goes to the weapons and out of the mouths of the poor. Um, I'll try to live my life in a, in a better way and I, again, I, I love Michael Brooks and f 
fuck 2020.